Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's good to have all of you here in our worship service together today. Thank you for coming and taking time out of your busyness of your lives and schedules. Um, I hope you didn't take it away from your family. I hope that you'll have an opportunity to at least be with your family and those you love this week. I hope you get to the cemeteries, wherever it is you need to go. If not, just to have a little time of remembrance for all the folks that have gone on before and uh, for their presence. We're going to do a little bit of a tribute for those that are in our armed services and those who gave their lives for that. But today as we begin, uh, I want to thank Tom because he's going to stand up and do our announcements. If you're not just kidding. <laughs> Tom, uh, remind me, uh, you know, I think it's good. Um, if you want to do announcements before I get here, you can do that. But I think we need to make sure that that happens. So what I'm going to do is take a little time here at the beginning by, by getting some announcements made um, as part of that. So you have your bulletin in front of you and some things that are going on. But there is an insert sheet. There's a couple of other sheets that are here today. Um, I, I want you to know that uh, I printed up some of the stuff that I gave out because there was a lot of stuff going on this week. And uh, I want to make sure that you've got it. So, you know, don't, don't complain to Linda because she didn't print it for me. I, I printed it and brought it over and dropped it in. It's made the booklet for today. So I want to uh, talk about a couple of things that are going on together today. So you get a chance to see it. Look at the announcements that are here. Teresa is going to come up and join me a minute because she has a couple of things she was relaying to me in a very nice, wonderful way that I have to be honest with you, she knows more about it than I do. And so I just said, will you, will you help us to make that? That'll work out real well uh, to put that together. Uh, there's some announcements here about uh, kids decorating for summer bags and all that kind of stuff. That's going to be an ongoing piece. If you would like to help out with the liturgy piece, uh, you can just sign up on one of the sheets over there that Linda graciously puts out, monitors, and uh, and has to report on, on Mondays when we do some staff meetings. You know, anybody signed up yet? So if you want to sign up, please go and sign up and make that happen. That would be a wonderful thing um, that's put it together. Also, those of you who are uh, doing things for doing the volunteers, uh, setting up for the fellowship time, it's always kind of cool to make sure that you have that and, uh, and put that together. We have some prayer requests we want to lift up. I want to add a couple of names to that. Number one is uh, Red Atwood. I had his service uh, this week on Thursday, and uh, Dawn was there, part of the family, and just to put that together. I want to thank her for all of her work and all the others that uh, really put that together. The congregation, the sanctuary was full. Uh, a lot of folks who just honor him. And I thought of all things, this is he's you know he was uh, part of the honor guard. Um, he's big to remember me that part of the service of the country and all of you. We're going to acknowledge part of that a little bit later in our service, but it was just amazing to talk about that, you know, as, as part of that, and for their family too. And a lot of good memories, positive memories through that. And I want to give thanks about that. Don. Um, may I just quickly thank yes. everybody that was um, involved with helping um, Pastor Phil. Thank you so much for the service that you provided. Thank you to the ladies that prepared the lunch for us. Um, we so much appreciate it. Um, and, and those that donated to the lunch, and just all of those that have sent cards or texts or Facebook posts and reached out with kind words. We really, really appreciate it. We're very, very thankful that we had so much time with Fred. He was almost 80, 88 years old. And um, we have lots of great memories of him. So while it's very hard to lose a loved one, um, we're just very grateful for the time we had with him and all the memories we created. So, uh, the church is a big part of that, so thank you all. Thank you, uh, and it was. The, this congregation had been part of their life for a number of years, and uh, we're just very thankful uh, for what they were able to do. Teresa, you want to pull up a couple of ones, and then I'll ask if any of you have any announcements here in just a second. Okay, in your bulletin, there's an insert about the TOTE program. So God has blessed our church family with the opportunity to serve our community this summer through our participation in the TOTE program. Um, with our Christian friends at the Baptist, the Catholic, and Christian churches. So um, there's going to be three, there's three Wednesdays out of the summer here. We're going to fill totes. Um, we're responsible for 17 children. And so we have four totes. Um, and on the back wall here, there's a bulletin with, or an easel with different items that we've labeled that we need to use um, to fill those totes. So if you want to grab a sticky note, and bring those back by June 11th um, so we can fill the totes the following Wednesday. If you have any questions, let me know or Cheryl Skidmore, and there's more information here on the little insert. Very good. 
Um, are there other announcements and things that need to be made uh, that you all have that we can bring up together today? Anything? Mark your calendars for the potluck June 26. June 26 for the potluck? Okay. We'll have to sign that sheet. Um, okay. Next week we'll have to. All right, very good. There are a couple of inserts in your bulletin. One of those is, a, is an insert that uh, talks about a response to uh, uh, Uvalde uh, at the church down there. I'll, I'll talk about that during the message the other day. I just want you to know it's there. There's an instruction sheet which gives you some specific ideas and directions if you want to make a gift of some kind or if you want to do one of the sheets. And there are uh, copies of uh, a form that's there that you can, we're going to be love notes. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, you can you can put it on anything. We're just trying to give them the half size sheets just so that we can get them down there. But I'll, I'll talk about that during the uh, part of the service, etc. Are there other um, <laughs> announcements you need to make? Oh, good. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> if you folks have liked our Quarry Springs Park Facebook page, some of you probably noticed that we're doing tours this weekend because it's about four miles around the whole park, and we want people to be able to see it. You know, people can't walk the two miles down, two miles back. And we there's been a lot posted this week with the loss of Pete Farby, uh, one of our board members. There's a lot of things that kind of got lost in the shuffle. But uh, if you can go on and scroll through there or just let me know, and we can schedule you. If you can bring your kids or family or anyone that wants to come out yet later today or tomorrow, um, we'll go from 9 to 6, well, 6 p.m. would be the last start tomorrow, too. So just want to let you know that. Uh, that's available for you. Very good. Excellent. I want to thank um, Janet Maltis, who's here with us today from over in the Bingo area. Uh, our dear friend Cheryl is in Boston. Her son is uh, getting his doctorate at MIT, and uh, she's located there. That's a real celebration, and we're glad that she got to go there and be part of that. She and her son who uh, did part of that uh, whole celebration. We want to thank her for that. For the graduates, that are here as part of our community and the people that we honored a few weeks ago and honored them as part of that graduation ceremony. Thank you for the way that you uh, participated by providing a place for one of our graduates, uh, for Craig, and to be part of that here. We want to give thanks for those kinds of things that were put together because that, that's, a, that's a great thing that we do that and support for all of our grads uh, as they go through that. So thank you. Uh, our political science uh, there's one other thing, political science, but what? Political science. Oh, is that it, just political science? Yeah, human rights. Human rights, yes, I don't want to forget that. Okay, very good. My wife uh, graduated with a degree in human rights uh, from uh, in Denver. And uh, when she went to college, went back to college, they said, we don't have anything to offer in that. And she goes, well, how do I get a degree in human rights? And they said, you mean human resources? And she says, no, no, no. In, in you know in civil rights no human rights they said we don't have anything how do we get that and she goes they said well you have to start out a whole program and submit it and go for it and see what you do and uh, my goodness she did it took her four years but she got approved and she was the first person to graduate with something called human rights as part of that and it's so wonderful to see that uh, become very much part of our world in which we mind today it's a great launch out so thank you uh, as part of as we uh, get together, the question for us today is, what, 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 are we, what are we talking about today? What's our focus today? And um, I have to tell you, I changed my message. <laughs> We're talking about boldness. We're talking about what would Jesus say about uh, Evolve? Um, I, I want to share that with you today because uh, I got, a, there's a lot of people in this world that are, that are, that are challenged right now in our churches. We're challenged because we don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. And I do not want to get lost. So today, I uh, the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and said, you need to preach a different message to them today that helps them and helps us to know a response that we can do, that the Colfax United Methodist Church can make a, can make a difference in, in what's going on there. Part of that came from my connection with the First United Methodist Church of Uvalde and uh, the pastor who was there. And so I'm going to bring you some Greetings and also give you some direction on what's needed uh, right on the front line. And uh, I think it's important for us as part of the connection to church to say to people like that, what can we do? Because by the grace of God, we could be there. 
I mean, it could be us. And that's the world in which we find ourselves living. And we do not want to shirk our duty to Christ and to our fellow man and women and children and see something come out of this in a way. I'm going to share a little bit about that as part of our service together today. But to look at the biblical answer for us that we can give to other people when people say to us, why does God allow something like this to happen? Why would God not stop something like that? What in the world is happening in America and in our world today? And it's critically important that you and I have the fresh insight of God's direction, not just our regurgitation of our own thoughts, but what God has to say in a fresh way that speaks specifically to us. So we have an answer to give. And that we have the opportunity to do something, to do something, and not to simply let it go by without honoring the memory of those and of that community and honoring it by doing something in a specific way. We're going to share as part of that today and give you the opportunity, not only to do it this week, but also throughout this coming week and into next week. We're going to kind of hit bases on this in two different ways. That's what we're going to talk about together today. The first thing I want to talk about is this is the day the Lord has made. If you turn in your hymn book to number 657, you'll find a hymn there that's called This is the Day. Um, it's like, uh, it's, it's, this is where we are. So I wanted to take an opportunity to sing this together with you. And let's join together. We'll sing it twice through. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's begin it there. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. another hymn, number 707. If you have your book, turn to that. Number 707. It's a song that traditionally we sometimes use during funeral services. It's a song called Hymn of Promise. Relatively new hymn for some people, but nonetheless, it talks about the things that happen in this world that sometimes we do not have answers for, but a God alone can see, and we take comfort in that, that God is with us. I invite you to join us as we sing all three verses of this song, number 707, him of promise. Here we go. In the palm there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in the moon's a hidden promise. Let's join again. 
Oh God, my hope comes from you. My faith comes from you. You are my source in the midst of the events of this world. You promise to be with us and not leave us. Your promise is to walk with us. Walk with us this morning, Jesus, as we are troubled and need your fresh word to bring peace beyond our human understanding, a peace this world does not fully understand. We need Jesus, you, Jesus, to walk with us this morning. As together we pray the bold prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. For I am an Easter person, I am a child of God. Amen. I invite you to turn and greet with one another. Welcome one another to our service together today. No one's invisible. Let them know you love them. Thank you. Thank you. Kids come down for a children's message this morning. Okay, this goes back a long, long time. But a long time ago, long time ago, we used to have these things. And th what they are, are a way for us to put a string on our finger. And that meant it was to remind us of something. Okay? So you go around, you're doing your work, you think, oh, gee, I forgot to, I need to remind myself of those things. Have you ever done that before? Anybody? 
Yes, no. You've never tied a ring. Ask your parents or others if they ever did that because that was the way that we used to do things sometimes is by, you know, is by putting it together and tying a little knot. And we just kept it on there because it reminded us of those kinds of things. So um, what kind of things do you do to remind you? Well, I brought some things today because I just thinking about this. Um, sometimes, uh, when I was a kid, we used to have these. Um, we had these these rocks, reminder rocks, you know, and you take them and you kind of put them in your pocket and you kind of, you know, pull them out and they kind of remind you of something or an important moment for you, you know, uh, ways to remember that. So rocks are one way to do that. Um, I've got some up here in, when we finish this thing, if you want to come up and grab one, you can. Um, I got another reminder. Oh, I know. This is another reminder. You know what this is? Huh? My grandmother, bless her. She used to wear these on her hand. I said, what do you got that rubber band on there for you? She goes, no, I keep it on there kind of as a way to remind myself of something that I need to do or something that's happened. Rubber band. You know, they have these bracelets and wristlets you can do. Like I've got some of these. Here's one that I have. You know what this one is? Yeah, it, it's a piece of string. And I put this on because I have some things on my wrist because they remind me of different things that I need to remind myself of, like God's watching over me and all kinds of things. But this one I put on this week for the folks down in uh, Uval. Do you know where that is down in Texas? Do you know what happened down there? Yeah. 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 How do you, how do you, what do you think about that? I think that was good for um, the teenagers too. Yeah. That's a tough thing, wasn't and it? I think he should have done that. I think he might have just, like, um, maybe, like, maybe took a nap and called him down, maybe, when he took a nap. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I think the whole world needs to take a nap. Um, there's a little thing that was written um, about that said sometimes what a guy wishes that the whole world would do what we did in kindergarten, and that's uh, take a nap, uh, sit down and have milk and cookie, and talk about people, about what we need to do different, and how we need to just calm down a little bit, and how we need to kind of get ourselves back into perspective. That's a good one. Um, are, are you scared because of what will happen in the Do you ever get nervous about that? About somebody? Do you do anything in school about? Preparing for those kinds of things? Yeah. yeah. You don't? Yeah. Some I of you do. Yeah. Did you do. that in middle school? Yeah? Okay. Not anymore. Do you are, are you are you does that scare you at all? A little, not much. Okay. What could we do for the folks down in Uvalde and uh, either parents or grandparents or people who've lost somebody? Are the people who are just down there or kids like yourself who are scared? What what because I know perspective of what I could do for parents and, and grandparents and that kind of stuff. But what I would be interested in is what could we do for somebody like you, uh, a kid? What, what 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 would it be helpful for you if you found yourself in that sort of situation? Pray. Pray? That's an excellent one. I mean, praying is what it's all about. It's very important. I was interested in how they kept talking about that this week. We need to pray about that. Other things that you could think about doing for people that are down there? We could send a letter to them. That's an excellent thing. I think we might do that today. That would be a good thing. What other things would you do? Do what? Donate stuff. You could donate stuff to them, yeah. There are people who need help and assistance, and I think that's an important thing, yeah. Give them one of our grasping crosses. Give them one of our grasping crosses. That would be a that would be an amazing gift. Uh, I saw some pictures this week of people who had rosary beads, you know, and grasping onto those and holding them and praying for them. In fact, the, the, the mother of the, of the young man who, you know, did this, she was sitting on the front porch of her mother's house that had been shot, and she was just rocking back and forth and praying her prayer beads, you know, and praying for them. I think that's an important thing for us to be able to do. I this uh, thank you for what you shared with me because I think it's important to hear from you. Sometimes we think about it as adults, but we never ask you as a kid what what would you like and what does that look like. I just think that if there's anything that you that you have and you want an answer for. I hope that you take an opportunity to kind of you know ask somebody or if you're scared or having a problem with that. I hope that you'll take an opportunity to do that and take that seriously.
because we live in a world where people do some crazy things sometimes and it's really sad uh, about that. But it also works is that, um, that you take an opportunity to kind of help people that you have in school. I say that because when I was a kid and I was in school and some people were just a little different, you know, they dressed a little different, they acted a little different, they sometimes weren't real friendly, you know, sometimes we just pretended they weren't there, or sometimes we kind of make fun of them and do those kinds of things, and, and uh, we call it bullying now sometimes, but how sometimes when we leave people out like that, they don't know their love and they don't know that anybody cares for them. And I think it's important for us to find ways to, you know, at least to be able to see them and to offer um, offer something that we can do for them. You know, if you're in school and you have somebody who gets hurt, you know, and they're crying, we go to them and say, "Oh, did something happen? Is that my puppy died or something?" And we, you know, we try to say, "Well, I'll pray for you. I'll be with you." And I think that's what we're to do as Christians is to do something about that to help you with that. I have this. Uh, which I have some of these strings I brought with me. And so when you get done here, I invite you to come up and grab one of these. And if you want to, you can take two of them, one for you and one for somebody else. And then maybe you want to put them on your wrist. That's what this one is, to remind you to pray for the folks down in Texas. And uh, maybe that's something that you'd like to put on and wear too. If you'd like to, I have some of those available for you and, and, and make that happen. So uh, when I was watching the program today, um, one of the things that they said down there, a pastor, one of the churches, said, what can we do for the people down there? And it was what you said. Number one thing, pray for them. It's so important. So, uh, you know, as, as kids, Jesus says, you know, children are leaving. Well, we're going to do the same thing. So let's just bow our heads and let's just pray together. God, I just pray that you'll be with, uh, with the people that are there and the Uvalde and the kids, parents people whose lives have just been torn apart. There's a lot of fear in this world. And yet you tell us that perfect love casts out fear. That means if we find ourselves loving you, then we have the opportunity of not fearing so much. Because we know, just like Christmas is, you're always with us. And for that, we give you thanks. I pray you'll be with each boy and girl here, be with their parents and others as continue to have conversations about what it means not only for us, but for others. For us to pray for our country, when we find ourselves becoming a country that we may or may not recognize, in the past at least. Give us the opportunity to, to be able to remember for a reason and a purpose, to continue to lift up the people who live in that community, the people in the state, people in our country, to be able to pray that we might make a difference. You've often said to us that prayers of kids uh, have a real way of getting to you, and you hear and answer those prayers like you do for all of us, and I pray that's what you'll do today. You'll be with us, and you'll add that into our prayer lists, and into our time when we pray at night, in the morning, and we'll just remember that when people are hurting, like you said, who is my neighbor? Anyone who's hurting. We know the people there are hurting, and we pray and be with them. Watch over us and help us to do the great gift of remembering. Remembering others and remembering you, God. For all this we ask in your holy name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Now, before you go, hey, I've got something here for you. Do you know what these are? Well, let me tell you. When I was a kid, growing up, uh, one of the things you were required to do was to put on a poppy. And last year, um, at a church uh, in the country, uh, they had a big service, and I uh, was able to talk there. Been talking there for several years, and it it was about poppies. And I told them the story about where poppy came from. That it's a place called Flanders Field over in Europe and France, and it was an opportunity there to talk about how. Uh, it was a way for us to remember the people who were in the armed services and how we pray for them, especially people who went through that because it could be a traumatic time, but especially for people who gave their lives for our freedoms, the kind of freedoms that you and I have to come to church, the freedom we have to pray, the freedom we have to be who you are. And there's so many things we have like that. 
And that was the gift given to us by people who understood that they had to go to battle for that and, uh, and do that. And so um, when, when I was a kid, they would, you'd have these, you'd always put them on you, and people would always know that what you do are remembering the people who served in the armed services and the people who were there. Probably some of you had parents, grandparents, great-grandparents that in some way, you know, served in, in the country. And so uh, I've got one of these. I have a lady named Janice over at the other church, and she supplied me with some of these. And uh, they're really cool. They only come out one time, but it talks about in memory of people and what that's all about. So I'm going to put these up here, too. So after church, you can come and get one. Uh, you can do that, too. But I'll put all this stuff up here, and you can come and grab one on the way, okay? Very good. Thank you. You can go back to your seats. This is a Memorial Day Sunday. It's an opportunity for us to remind ourselves. We are remembering those that have been part of our life that have gone on and are not present with us anymore, that are in heaven. The promises that we have as Christians that we'll see each other again. And the other side of that is to remember those, as I said before, to the kids who are serving in our armed services. And uh, I just like to find out this morning, um, are there any people here that were in the armed services? I just like to know you can just put your hand up real quick and I can see Brandon, I see you there. Other people that served in the armed services um, as part of that. Um, again, I'm certain that, that there are people that are in your life. There are people in this town, people in this church, and others. Uh, we have a board here uh, that show pictures of all the people who have served. And uh, we want to just have an opportunity in a way to say thank you to them for what they've done and how they've, uh, and how they've served their country and how they've helped us to maintain who we are and uh, what we were founded on to become. So as part of that, what I'd like to do is to offer up a prayer uh, for those people. And they get forgotten sometimes, but we wanna at least offer that up. So um, there's a prayer in your bulletin today. It's called Memorial Day Tribute. And I just invite us to join together as we pray this prayer. Let's pray. Father, today we pause to reflect on the sacrifice made by those who paid the ultimate price on behalf of our nation. We pray that their sacrifices are never forgotten, nor is the pain of their families. We acknowledge that freedom comes at a cost and pray that we can pursue peace. We hope that someday we'll celebrate Memorial Day as just a memory of a time before we started living the peaceful existence you intended for us since the beginning of creation. Let us turn to you, Lord, in our grief and in our remembrance of the fallen. Guide us towards a harmonious existence as we honor those who were willing to give up their lives that they may gather here today freely. On this Memorial Day, we pray for peace and for those who gave all. Lead us towards a world where there no more must give up their lives in pursuit of freedom. May we be receptive to your guidance and may we never forget the fallen. Amen. So many of those, uh, in so many ways, um, that have uh, made that sacrifice for us. We want to remember all of them. Uh, as we get ready to hear the word together today, Doug's going to come and read that for us, but let's join together in preparing it by singing Thy Word. <laughs> saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil at all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. And from the Message Bible, God saw the human evil was out of control. People thought and acted evil. 
evil, 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 from morning to night. God was sorry that he had made the human race in the first place. It broke his heart. God said, I'll get rid of my ruined creation. Make a clean sweep people, animals, snakes and bugs, birds, the works. I'm sorry I made them. God said to him, no, it's all over. It's the end of the human race. The violence is everywhere. I'm making it clean sweet. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever read that passage before? Sometimes we don't preach on it as pastors. Especially with the reality of these words. And God's heart was grieved. God grieved because of those things. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, uh, oftentimes when I talk about this or use this particular passage, people say to me, God was grieved? How could God be grieved? But God was. In fact, four times in Scripture come these words. Um, when God found himself grieving over his creation, turning his back upon that, and in reality doing exactly the very thing that he created them not to do or desired them not to do. God created free will, gives us the opportunity to make choices. If we didn't have that, we would be robotons. We would always say, you're going to love me forever, no matter what, and there would be no exchange of perfect love. It's the same thing like in a human relationship when a husband and wife are married, and all of a sudden we begin to discover the challenges of the process to go through what it means to learn to love one another in a new way, in a way that seeks forgiveness, a way that seeks comforting the others before our own, a way of seeking to find ourselves learning what it means to say, I forgive, and be able to offer forgiveness as a gift of love rather than that which is demanded. As we find a new way of living in relationship together. If you've seen any of us that have gone through that process, you understand what it means when we grieve over those moments and times. God's heart was grieving. He was grieving to the point of saying, I'm going to destroy the world because the world is evil. Evil, 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 he says. Now, I'm an optimist, so therefore I believe there's good in the world, and I seek to do that. But there are times, even in Jesus' world, where he found himself singling out those that were evil, both those who sought to crucify his son or those that the world deemed as evil, like a woman who gathered as a Samaritan on the well in the middle of the day because she'd been bullied so many times about the number of husbands that she had. And Jesus said, I want to go there. I need to talk to her. Jesus found himself coming to those people who were ill or those who had died. Jesus came even to talk to those who had been filled with the evil spirits. And that's the kind of people Jesus hung out with. People who were gripped by evil and people who at times made the wrong choice and decisions. Sometimes those people are me. I try not to do big, bad, evil things. Sometimes people will say, I try not to do big, bad, evil things when people are watching. But at other times, we all do that and get by with it. And sometimes our choice and decisions lead us into times of challenge and temptation. I was going to preach about boldness today, and I thought, you know what? I think it's important for us to talk about boldness, but another side of boldness. Maybe boldness in praying, which I think is important. That's what the kids were helping me to do. But also, a boldness that comes for us in knowing what it means for our hearts to be moved, both head and heart, to move our hands and feet in doing something, even before situations or circumstances happen. There are a lot of people grieving. In Texas, there's a lot of people grieving in Uvalde. There's a lot of people that are grieving in the United States. And there's a lot of people who are grieving in the world over all kinds of things. But I have to include in that God. Because I believe today God is grieving. 
Did you see the picture of the church that put uh, 21 chairs out in front of the congregation? I thought about calling today and having to do that. Put 21 chairs outside of the church, just chairs empty, as a way of us symbolizing that our hearts grieve too because they're missing. Maybe we do that next week. I don't know. I don't know what your response will be, but we will have a response, and I'll share some of that as we go through the message together today. It was hard to see another tragedy occur in our community and in our world. It was difficult for us because as soon as something like this happens, we immediately move and posture into a position that I don't know if it would be a God position. Our position usually is to say, who is to blame for this circumstance and situation? I have to be honest with you, uh, when all this occurred, I had been living in the midst of this, and I, 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 it was nighttime, we were going to eat, and my, we went to the other room, we were sitting down to eat, and my wife was watching television, she's watching what was going on, and I thought to myself, oh Lord, I just don't want to have to eat with this going on. It is not how my appetite. If I could just go in the other room or change the channel and do something, that would be much better. But the Lord kind of said to me, don't change that channel. You need to live and be present in the moment. It was hard for me. I lost my appetite when I saw what was there. For me, it brought back memories, and I'll share that with you in a minute. It is important for us as Christians to be present in the moment and for our heads and hearts to react and for us to understand what that reaction is. I pray that you never come to a point in your heart and life where you do not react, even if people are unknown to you. The heart of God is new. You know, in the world in which we live, it's a little difficult sometimes. You know how we drive down the road and we see these people with signs holding up, go help me, and we, we sometimes almost wreck by turning our heads and how do we deal with it? We sometimes say to ourselves, I do not see you. The sad thing is when you're first in line and you park right next to those persons and they sit there and they look at you. And maybe they're not asking for money. They're just saying, good morning, hi. Maybe what they're saying is, I'm a real person. You see me. You see, in the world today, that's what a lot of people want. Someone just to know they're there that they exist, that they are a child of God. They may not use that term, but I use that term, that I'm real. And because I'm real, I have needs, I have wants, I have, I have things in my life that are out of control. I need someone to rescue me at times. I need someone just to acknowledge that they love me and that I am wanted. Those two words have haunted me for a long time that we know that we are loved and we know that we are wanted. In whatever context you want to place it, those are the two words that Christ says to us as his disciples, we need to be on the lookout for people who want to be loved and want to be wanted. They are the ones who are I refer to and have throughout my ministry as the invisible ones. In having conversations with me, you'll hear me say that. In groups of clergy and pastors, even this week, I said the word again. And God helped the invisible ones, the ones that we don't see. Last week, I was talking about, in one of the churches, um, we were talking about things to do, you know, how we boldly pray for people. One of the things I said to them is, we need to remember to boldly pray for those people who are single-parent families. There's a lot of that in this show. Um, I, I, I find a lot of them working at Walmart who ask me if I'm having a good day and I say yes but I never sometimes ask them if they are but when I have they tell me about how they work a second job their kids are all alone because they just need money their heart is there and they're scared to death that DHS or somebody else is going to show up and something's going to happen and I think what an existence what a world do we live in I asked one of the churches a few weeks ago, do you know how many people in, in Jasper County are, are single parent families? 
Because I think it's critically important that we know that. I have to live with that. You have to live with that. <laughs> you know what the percentage is? Take a guess. 32%. Now that may seem like nothing, right? It's only 32%. That's a third. That means if I was talking about people here, how many of you would find yourself in the category? Why would I even care? Because I care because it has an impact on people's lives. It has an impact on where we are and where we come from and maybe guilt or all kinds of things that happen. Maybe the less than this. It's critically important that our hearts are moved and we know those numbers and we seek to make a difference and commit ourselves lifelong, either in a career or simply living as a Christian. Jesus did it and was chastised at every point. He was crucified because he was talking about people who found themselves needing to be loved and wanted. And that included the very scribes and Pharisees that claimed to death. So what are we going to do with that? You and me. What are we going to do with you and all of me? How many of you know where the town is? What state? Do you know where in Texas it's located? Do you know that kind of thing? I struggled with that this week. Um, I struggled in knowing that. So you know what I did? I went to look up, and you know what? You gotta understand me. I had to look up what churches were in Uvalde. And I discovered there is a First United Methodist Church in downtown Uvalde. Steve Payton is the pastor. And I thought to myself, you know, with everything going on in that town, I hope this guy's a good pastor and actually does something about reaching out to people in this community there. And I discovered he went to the same seminary I went to. One of them. And I just thought, wasn't that amazing? My, restores my health because I know he's going to be talking about those kinds of things, etc. I thought to myself, I need to talk to somebody, maybe him or Barbara, who is his children's pastor, because I have no idea what's going on. I want to send money, but I don't know where my money would go if we all be used for that. And all of a sudden, I thought I got a United Methodist Church, part of the connectional church system, right? That's down there. And, and those people are on the front line and they don't get away from it. They live there in that moment. Maybe that's who I need to talk to. Maybe that's who I need to ask. And rather than coming up with what I think. Maybe rather than sending in a personal gift, I need to make a personal gift and an impassioned gift to those that were struggling in their life. I learned about that in my ministry. I lived in Colorado for 10 years, and while I was there, I remember that I had a youth group that came to me from First United Methodist Church in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. You know where that is? They came there just a year after a bomb had gone off and had destroyed part of their church. And here they were. <laughs> and uh, they were coming there for a ski trip with the youth group and I thought great etc and I was doing a service on Sunday morning in the chapel we always had a big crowd and I looked in the back and there was two strangers sitting back there two guys and I thought I wonder what that's all about and when the church ended these guys came up to me and they said could we talk to you for a minute and I said yeah they said we're the pastor and the youth leader from First United Methodist Church in Oklahoma City and we brought that youth group here I said oh yeah you did well one of the boys in the youth group over at the cafeteria at the ski area took us a tray a food tray Went up on top of the mountain, sat on it, came down and hit a tree. And uh, now he's in intensive care. They don't think he's going to make it. And we had to call the parents back home and talk to them about that. We've got a whole group of kids that are in tears. We can't get back home right now. We don't know what to do. Could you come and talk to us? And they said, we want you to talk to us. I'm the pastor. He's the youth pastor. We're grieving too. We need help. Now, a lot of people think pastors have got it together. They don't goo those kinds of things. They got the answers and all that stuff. But you know, my heart was there. I remember going to that group of kids in Oakland Hills. And I remember the pastor saying to me, It was our church that was damaged so badly when that bomb went off. And now this. And I remember I didn't know what to do exactly. I was about the whole thing. And I said to the kids, I have a piece of paper. Talk to me. And we talked and we did that whole thing. He said, take out a piece of paper, and I want you to write a note to your friend. And someone said to me, yeah, but he's in the hospital, and he's uh, too, he's not conscious. I said, it's okay, write the note. We'll take somebody there to read it to him. And they did. 
a few months later, when all this had passed, they wrote back and talked about what a difference it had made, and especially in the life of those kids, because they actually had an opportunity to express their feelings and their thoughts and actually do something, write it, present it. And I thought, wow, God, I gotta remember this. And I did, I had several tragedies that occurred, and each time I'd say to them to do something like this because it was important, I think it's a good thing for us to do. But how do we respond in a moment like this? What does it look like? I had a veteran call me this week, and then he wrote me a note. I want you to hear what this veteran says. He said this to me in his tearful voice, what's happening to this world? And he wrote this to me. I'm praying constantly for our nation's soul. I did not serve so many years to have my America come to this. I'll be spending a lot of time in the church on my knees. The story of Adam and Eve is our story, whether you consider it to be physically a man and woman first, or whether it's just an analogy for all the human race. That story has come to us as a way to say to us that you and I have an opportunity to uh, make choices. There is a word that is spoken to us in this story of Adam and Eve, which talks about them having in the opportunity to choose good or bad, as we call it. Make one choice or another. The ultimate decision in that is, do you make a choice considering God, or do you not make a choice considering God? Now, the reason I say that is, we give them a really hard time, or it's human, by saying, you need to listen to what God says and do it. Until we look at ourselves and say, I guess it's better for them. Oh, I give God the big stuff, but I don't give out the little things. But the little things oftentimes seed the bed for us to choose to see people with signs holding up and call them invisible because we do not want to see them. It's as old as the beginning of time. Adam and Eve were given a choice. They made their choice. They made their decision. And their decision was good, perhaps bad, by some would you call it. But nonetheless, the bottom line of it, it chooses our will over God's will. And sometimes we just forget to invoke God's name in any situation or at any time at any moment. When you see them all, the Uvalde thing, did you pray? I'm not trying to pass judgment. I'm just asking. Did you ask the question, what would God have me do in this moment? Did you do it? Did you just feel bad and say, I'll pray about that sometime, but you've forgotten? No. Those people are still hurting down there. What have we done? But I got Memorial Day weekend. This is an opportunity for me to go out and have fun. <laughs> Lots of stuff going on, you know, we'll party on. And not that that's not a good thing to do with family and being with them, but where does it fit into us that we have the opportunity of living out what we are to do? Jesus says, you have a purpose, and that is when the world hurts, even someone you don't know, you should be moved with care and compassion to do something or dedicate your life to help those people. And do not stop. I was not a religious person, and I gave that up. And God captures me and brings me back into this job. And I'm thinking, I don't do that anymore. And here I am. God sent me to Haiti to be with a bunch of folks down there. As my sons would say to me, Dad, you're flying into a re revolution. Don't you mean you can't leave the airport? And I go, yep. But what if they kill you or capture you? Well, it's where the Lord that I live, the Lord that I die, whoever died, go on the Lord. There I am. Yay. What can we do to help the people of Uvalde? What does that look like? How could God allow this to happen? I heard someone this week say this. Why did it happen? Well, God just needed another angel in heaven. That's why he took the kids. Or it was just God's will. Friends, I have to tell you, we sometimes say that because we don't know what else to say. But that's wrong. 
But come to me, I'll be glad to go over with you. You show me your passage of scripture, I'll be glad to talk about it. But sometimes people even say, well, that's what it says in scripture. God just needs another angel in heaven. Come on. Are you kidding me? Did you ever have seven day events come and knock at your door? And you know exactly what they're there to do. They got the white shirt, they got the tie, they got the little badge. And you think, they're going to ask me if I died today, would I go to heaven? And they're probably going to ask me to pull out my Bible and show me things that I do right or wrong. Everything. I'm just going to go hide in my house and not answer the door. Close the curtains. I remember when I had a group come to my house and they said, we would like to talk to you. I said, let's go, let's talk about this. And they did. Finally, we thought, they said, you got a Bible? I said, yeah. They said, if you die, could you go to heaven? I said, yeah. They said, you're pretty sure about that. What's that all about? And I said, I just believe that. You do? I said, yeah. There's a couple of passages of scripture. Let me give some of those to you. And they go, whoa, 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 whoa. It was a wonderful experience. I love it. It was one of my crowning moments. And you know what? If they come to, I have been known to actually search people out and have those conversations, including any one of other traditions, because I think it's important, and I don't know all the answers. Sometimes I fall apart, but it's okay because I just need to know that. I just need to put it to my test. You and I need to know what to say when people come to us this week, if they haven't already, and said to us, why did God allow this to happen? And why is there pain and suffering like that in the world? You hear me? And I want you to be able to do something besides hide or to say something to them that says, it, God just needed another angel in heaven. So what would you say? Have you ever heard of agency? Do you know that word, agency? It's a theological event, but there's other times we use it. We use it in, in sometimes dealing with people in psychological terms. Agency, what it means is, is that uh, we have the opportunity to feel or be part of making choices or decisions in our life. Uh, it's not about a, a Organization. It's the word agency. Go look it up. You'll have a fun time with it. There's that obscure little thing, but it's, that's how we use the word. And how we use it is that you and I are given the opportunity to make choices. God gave us agency as part of our spiritual well-being. Instead of God making you a robot and saying you always have to love me in a certain way, etc., God says to you, no, I want you to also understand you have free will. You can make a choice. You have to demand you to do something about people who are in need. No, you don't have to because then it will not be a gift that you offer out of love. Therefore, love has to be the dominant way of doing that. You and I have a choice of agency. We have a choice to say yes or no in situations. We have a choice to help or not to help. We have that choice. However, if we make those choices that are not involving God or at any other point, then the scripture passage that Doug read for us today comes into play. Because when we don't do that, God's heart does what? Grieves. And we don't care. Well, maybe. We get over it. There's a bunch of people whose hearts are grieving. There's a bunch of people in Iowa whose hearts are grieving over a variety of different topics and subjects. But you and I need to have care and compassion for that. We need to say, how can we make a difference? We have agency. The opportunity to choose for God or not to choose for God. Evil finds itself in this world being manifested. God did not remove evil from the world, but gave us the opportunity to struggle and to make those choices and decisions. What God promises us is not the fact that we are a Christian that nothing will ever happen to us, but he says, what I offer you is I will be with you. The 23rd Psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid. Why? Because thou art with me. My presence being with you makes all the difference. It's like when I fly into Haiti and they said, what if you die? And I said, well, live or die, then I belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose to be Lord, the living Lord of the dead. There, there, that's a scripture passage. <laughs> it's okay. What a way to go, right? I mean, for a reason and a purpose, I think that's all together right. I think that's what we're meant to do and to be. There's all kinds of struggle that's gone on there, the civil rights movement and other movements that have gone on in our nation. We have to come to grips with those things. They have to move us, and we have to do something about them. Not to avoid them, but to make a choice and decision, and not your choice alone, but to go to Scripture, and what does Scripture say? What does God say to me? And to pray about that. 
and see what happens. You know what the pastor down there, the evangelist, he said? The greatest thing he said he could do for my people, he prayed. That's what he should do, pray for them. And you know what the second thing was? He said, pray for me. <laughs> I don't know what to say to these people. I've been praying for them, but they're in such deep darkness that it's tough. What God does for us is this too. God takes evil and brings out good. Did you hear what I just said? That's okay. If you want to, take your hands and try it. God takes evil and he brings out good from evil. <laughs> he brings out the good if we allow it to happen. That's what Easter's all about. Crucify Jesus. He's dead. What does God do? Takes that death thing and a cross, rings out good, and even takes the cross and rings out a symbol that you and I wear around our necks the way to symbolize our faith, the life, and our hope. God rings out good from evil. That's my response to people like me. It's terrible. But God rings out good from evil. In 2000, I was in Colorado. I remember being in the grill um, and getting ready to go into a staff meeting. And all of a sudden, this thing came up on the screen that said, a shooting at Columbine. And I thought, where's Columbine? I have no idea. In Colorado. And it's like, not too far from where we are, up in the mountains. I thought, well, what's that all about? And I remember going through that process and seeing what was going on, what was happening there, and my heart all of a sudden felt uncomfortable because I thought, I think I know some people who live there. And if not, I know people who live in Colorado, like myself, who have connections. And we went through that whole Columbine thing. What do we do with that? We decided that we were going to open up the YMC of the Rockies, a, a lodge cabin for every family that went through that, and they could come for free and spend an entire week in the mountains just being in a place. Now, when they came, they brought all that with them, and sometimes when they were in the mountains, all that kind of released itself, and they were there, and they would call me and say, can you do something? We got this family in this cabin. They need some help. They need somebody to come and help them and talk to them and that kind of stuff, and I did. I remember one Christian father who had a child in Columbine came to me. And uh, I, I remember I said to him, would you like me to pray for you? He goes, no. And I said, how's it going with you? He said, damn it, damn it, damn it. I used that in a sermon once. Somebody gave me after. He said, Pastor, you think you ought to say that at church service? And I said, I think it's a perfect word. When my mother and father died, they were getting older. I thought, what the hell? I said, God, why do you let people get old and die? What do you mean? Cancer? What's all this kind of stuff? You know, damn it, damn it, damn it. Jesus saw that kind of stuff and he said, in reality, you got somebody with a demon? Damn that. You got somebody who's paid with you? Damn that. Let's heal you. Let's get things put together. Let's make things happen again. That was, I think that was his thing. I think that's where we are. You know, damn those things. Those are not of God. Those are of evil. And God takes the evil and brings out something good from it. You know Cassie Bernal? Anybody know that name? She was one of the girls at uh, Columbine. And when the two guys stood there and they decided, they walked down the line and they said, are you a Christian? Yes, boom. Are you a Christian? Boom. Are you a Christian? Boom. And they asked Cassie, as the witness said, are you a Christian? She said, I am. Boom. Her dad, Doug, decided to start up a foundation to deal with people in schools. How do we make schools safer? All kinds of stuff to deal with that kind of thing. That was his way of saying, we want to do something out of this. We want to remember. We want to make something happen from this process. It's a wonderful thing. One that comes back to me is uh, is the Scott girl. Do you, do you remember her? She's the young lady who, uh, kind of quiet girl. Um, Demir, she belonged to two youth groups <laughs> because they were some part for her to go and be part of, etc. She had some Christian things she was trying to put in her life, and she became a Christian not too long before she was killed. And they asked her the same question. They said, uh, Rachel Scott, 
And they said to her, uh, are you a Christian? And boom, got shot and the whole thing. And the whole thing. Her, her dad and mom decided to do something. They started up a foundation and it's called Rachel's uh, Challenge. Uh, and it's the number one thing in schools today um, where they come in and they do this whole program about talking about Rachel's Challenge. Some of you have seen that kind of thing. That's what it's all about. And it's put together. And they came in and they didn't want to a school and in talking about it, here's the words that were said. I, 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 I couldn't forget this. This was an amazing word that was offered. And it said, this is a, a young man who was leaning towards doing harm to people. And after this, here's what he said. All my life, I prayed that someone would love me and make me feel wanted. And God sent an angel. That's you all. It was out of Christian care and compassion. And they started up this foundation, and that's what they do. They make a difference because of that. So that that becomes that. And what they did was find people who are having needs in their life and finding ways to help them, not to make them invisible, but to help them. The people who look a little goth or dress strangely and help them. The young man Ramos, who went through this process, have you seen those pictures they have? It looks like he's, you know, kind of a, out of the streets book or whatever. Have you seen one a few days before this whole incident? He is streaked, just absolutely emaciated. And what did they say? He wore the, this thing about being a shooter as a badge or a mom, whatever. He wore it because at least people acknowledged him. That's using. Rachel's challenge is because people do these things sometimes just to let somebody know they're here and they're alive. They pick it back. They, they fulfill those things as part of that thing. How do we find ways not to allow that to happen? What were the lessons of Columbine? Real quickly. Number one, and these are lessons for, for right now, for uh, you know. Number one is care about people. Uh, we have a thing called community. We need to celebrate that. Christian community here. We need to see people. Everyone is there. No one's invisible. We need to reach out to those kids, whoever they are, and give them time, energy, and effort. If there are those who have ostracized themselves, we need to do something about that. Care about people. Number two, listen and relate rather than put people down. I'm glad that some Christians are not in schools. Because lovingly, I know some people who say, well, that's just a bad kid. He's just bad. He always gets in trouble. I know we have to resource people who are all going to help, but sometimes we we just shouldn't be there because it's not good for us. You and I need to find a way to engage that and make that happen in a way to talk about that. You know what I did today with the kids? I said to them, how do you react to that? What's, what's it look like to you? Sometimes it's to find people who are invisible and to say to them when no one else does, what do you think about this? What do you think? and give them the opportunity, one, to recognize they're alive and they are a person, and number two, to ask their opinion. And sometimes to bring them out of a situation that says, no one loves me and I'm not, I'm not here anymore, I'm not there. You hear what I'm saying? Okay, very good. To feel loved and to feel that and help people understand it. The third thing is this. Mental illness is a pandemic. The governor down there in Texas, he said, you know, within 100 miles, 150 miles of here, we do not have any place for people to go that we don't know us. Uh, now, I, I don't know how it is here in your county, but I know in places I've been, um, that's one thing that if I talk about that, sometimes people go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you see, yeah, I think Jesus talked about it. You know those people, they say they're demon-possessed? And we say today, well, it's probably just, you know, have mental illness. <laughs> You've been around some people, you think to yourself, it was like demon possession. You know, Jesus said, those are the kind of people I want you to think about. I want you to be aware. I want you to do something about them. I had a guy come to my office one day. He said, I need money. I said, why do you need money? He said, because I need to get my medication. Otherwise, I'm going off the deep end. I said, do I have money for it? don't have any of that kind of thing. I don't have it. I called up my county. I said, you guys need to do something about that. We've got all kinds of money for this. Nobody ever comes to us. <laughs> You're one of the first ones in a long time that's even asked. Can you come to my church and talk about this with people? Well, I guess. 
There's all kinds of things available. Sometimes we're not allowed because of the legal limitations of it, but sometimes we're just not allowed because we never asked the question. We're not there to prescribe or to present, but sometimes people just don't know. They get so confused, they don't understand that. But there's all that kind of help available. It's amazing what's there. And if not, then you and I get to do something about it. Right? Yes. The Lieutenant Governor of Iowa, right, happened to be one of my campers that I grew up with and had him stay in my house so many times he didn't want to go home, he just wanted to stay with us. And he had a program the other day, uh, the governor giving out awards and stuff, and I happened to be there, and uh, he said to me, do you remember me? I go, yes, I remember you. I stayed in your house, remember? We ate pizza, watched television, watched movies. Two nights I stayed there, and I stayed the whole rest of the next week. I know that's who you are. That made a change in my life. I said, really? You know, there's some things that need to be changed in other people's lives, too. So here's what I'm doing. I'm on a mission here to talk about mental illness in Colfax. I know you may think it's not here, but there it is, or at least in the county. And I'm going to uh, maybe feel compelled to move somebody in to come and talk to you like that lady, the guy who came and talked to you about the Women in the Well program, to have them come and talk to you a little bit about that, about what we, what sources are available to us and what we can do and how we need to handle that situation. I think that's important for me. Uh, my neighbor is the governor, I live in Terrace Hill. And, uh, but I know him, I know the Lieutenant Governor. He was one of my kids. <laughs> so I'm gonna have a conversation with him and say, what can we do about the mental health situation in the legislature? What can we do about mental health situations in our communities? Whether it's drug abuse or whether it's soldiers returning from war, whether it's people who do all kinds of things, I, I find a way to make something happen. And I just want to be supportive. But I want to talk about it. It's not invisible anymore. If you want to help me in that, let me know. I have no idea where I'm even going with this. <laughs> all I know is God said you got to, you got to talk to people about it. Make it happen. I even told somebody I was going to talk about that today. And they go, that's why I said to you that Jesus dealt with mental illness. <laughs> he talked about it all the time. So, in front of you happens to be some papers. I'm, I'm finishing now. In front of you happens to be some papers. And on those papers, there are uh, there's a little thing there that talks about uh, what you can do. There's two sides of that. One's a little shorter and one's a little longer. One is to write a note to the people at the United Methodist Church in New York. Uh, Steve Pinkett's name is down there and the whole thing, and to write it up to them. They're all growing through some grief, and we need to spread some words of hope. Okay? On the right side of that is one to write to the parents of people down in Yvonne. You could write it to one of the parents who lost a kid if you want to. That's okay. Just start it out by saying that. You can tell them you're from Colfax. I don't know. Tell them whatever you want. Tell them they'll be praying for them. Give them your phone number. If they need help, tell them. Call me. Whatever. Remember, if God brings some good out of evil. And you can do that. There's other sheets that are over here somewhere that are whole sides of half sheets. I just like you to stay within that or use the back two because what we're going to do is we're going to send those uh, down there. Uh, I have a conversation. Uh, it's what's helpful, and we're going to put it on the front line. You don't have to wonder is it ever going to get there? It's going to get there. And so uh, you can fill it out this week and drop it off at the church, or you can bring it next Sunday. You can drop it off wherever you send it with somebody else. Maybe take some extra and invite friends of yours. To say, if they're saying, what can we do? Say, do what I did. What our church, what did your church do? You fill out these things we wrote down. We told people we're praying for them and everything else. And they sent them down there right to the front lines, the people at Uvalde. And I said, what? Yeah. So that's what I, I, I invite you to do that. My idea for that came from Columbine days. But I think it's an important thing for us to do. And I want to I want to offer that to you. You don't have to do whatever you want to do, but I want to offer that to you. Second of all, is we have one of our churches that is making a, a gift, a larger gift, to the First United Methodist Church in, in, in Uvalde to help them in their ministry uh, coming up. Because in contacting July 11th and 14th, they have vacation Bible school scheduled for their entire community. Is this advantageous? And a little help would be helpful because they got a lot more people that are going to be dealing with and helping out down there than what we did before. If you'd like to make a donation, you can do that. You can take a, a check or card or put it in an envelope, just put UV, it's in the volume, 
put Texas on it or something or put it in the memo line and just drop it off at the plate this week or next week. And uh, we'll make sure it goes to the front lines. To the front lines. You know what the name of their vacation Bible school program is? Yes, Jesus, yes. I thought, yeah, I, I, I want to help. I want to do something when you're not that. And the, what they said to me, they're a close-knit community. They are close. And they're there for one another. It's going to take time. All kinds of stuff. But some of these are opportunities for people. And I think one of those is your help from a stranger. And I think one of those is any gift you'd like to give, even if it's just a dollar or something else. If you're worried about, will it ever be used in the right way? You know how you do that sometimes, and therefore you just don't do anything? This will be used and go directly to them. You make out the check to the First United Methodist Church and for them to use it. For your pastor or Barbara, their children's ministry person, um, to put something together and make that happen there. They're going to be on the front line. They are now. Well, that's the end of my sermon. There you go. Um, I went over. Thank you. Sorry. Forgive me. Um, but if all else fails, just go love your kids, your grandkids. Go love somebody. Let them know they are loved and they are what? Wanted. And don't forget that. That's the biblical piece. That's what the people at Columbine said. And that's what the people down there are saying the same thing. That's what even the person who did the shooting said. They want to be known, they want to be wanted, and they want to be loved. That's just about raising your prayer. God, there's nothing I can say. So what I'm going to do is give one minute for us just to quietly pray to ourselves and pray to you. And then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. God, hear our prayers. We pray the name of Jesus over this church, this community, the people that are here, the people throughout this nation, country, state. We thank you, God, for giving us an opportunity and a reminder that you bring good out of evil. Therefore, we're called to make good choices for every choice we make. May that be a God choice. We pray for those who find themselves in the grips of illness. We thank you for the opportunities and things you have to help us. May we demonstrate this week that every person we see will let us see them to in some way con convey to them love, that they're wanted. Enlist us in that. That when we have something we see that we think is wrong, we take the opportunity to try to make it right. That's 
it's critically important that that's what God calls us to do. That's why we are people that follow Christ. And now be with us as together we pray that prayer that you taught each one of us when we gather to pray from our hearts, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to turn in your hymn books to number 368. And then I invite you to stand, and we're going to sing just the first verse and the chorus of a song called My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. And I'm just so happy that Janet's here today because she she watched me go through and change things, and she is really great. I appreciate that she's still here with me. Okay, very good. So let's stand and join together. Number 368. Here we go. Share the love. That's what I pray. May God lead us to a moment where we are able to speak that word in faith and love and demonstrate it by our life. Go make a difference in the world, we pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Friends, go be the church. Get out of here. <laughs>